Yeah, I'm Aggie Haynes uh, and I'm going to talk today about the body as an everyday design material. Um, so to give you a bit of history about myself, uh, yeah, I, I call myself a speculative designer, but also my background um, is in sculpture and I like to use a lot of sculptural techniques within my work, so I found the conversation early, earlier really interesting. Um, so our bodies are this amazing space um, filled with lots of practicable substances um, and parts that we weren't really born with are introduced into our our bodies and this is something that's sort of become the norm um, and I'm interested in this sort of representation of the body and the way that we can uh, present it and our sort of um, relationship with technology and our needs and desires as well as sort of horrors and disgusts regarding the future of biological design so yeah the, the line between our bodies and the rest of the material world are becoming quite hazy um, and often the way we try and deal with that is by dismantling things so you know if we don't know what's going on inside our bodies we'll try and cut them open to see what's happening but the way we represent the body can have a massive effect on the way we use the material um, so these beautiful images of the brain um, Oh, is it not working? Is that better? Yeah? Um, yeah, from Vesalius's book about the, the fabric of the body, um, uh, are really interesting because they're kind of romanticized images about how, how we look at our, our insides. Um, and these are sort of almost questionably advertisable for a time when um, things like public dissections were really popular. Um, so in England around 1750 or 1751 when the Criminal Dissection Act came around and this was when uh, people started to allow criminals who were um, who were hung to be dissected for entertainment and for research, shown here in, in one of Hogarth's plates. But it's kind of interesting because obtaining human material is, is and always has been quite a difficult task. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about Burke and Hare, um, and these are their live casts. Um, but they supplied bodies to surgeons in order for them to dissect them in front of audiences. And the, the story behind how they did this is really quite interesting because they sort of started to realize that there weren't enough people dying quick enough to supply to surgeons. So they started coming up with other ways of, of obtaining corpses through doing things like digging up graves. And then um, even worse, they started to produce corpses themselves by killing people. Um, but why, why I find their story quite interesting is because not only was Burke, um, uh, he was executed and then his skeleton was put on display and it's now at Edinburgh Surgery, uh, Surgical Museum, um, but also uh, his skin was sort of made into these lovely souvenir um, booklets <laughs> and this is kind of really interesting because this in itself is sort of quite an interesting piece of design that you might want to keep part of someone's body as, as a souvenir but it's it what's quite interesting about this is that it's kind of um, it, this wasn't like a one-off um, actually a lot of books were made out of human skin and it's it's called anthropodermic bibliopagy and it was sort of very very popular at the time but now we still have this high demand for human material um, and we're going about other ways and there are new technologies that, that are sort of coming about in order to obtain this fabric. So things like looking at, um, you know, sort of uh, regenerative species or things like stem, stem cell growing um, or even the growth of things like human cells within other species. So uh, this is quite a recent piece of research where they grew human cells into a rat. Um, and it's different from, I'm sure you've all seen the one where they inserted cow cartilage into a mouse. Um, but it's quite amazing that, that this is sort of 
uh, quite disturbing that um, I found it interesting that it's not just something that we would grow in ourselves, <laughs> that the rats has sort of become this intermediary product for us to do this. Because really our, our bodies are already capable of regrowth and regeneration. So in these sort of old pictures of rhinoplasty surgeries, um, people used to do things like borrow, borrow skin from elsewhere to, to re-sculpt the face um, using sort of similar techniques, techniques that you might use in sort of sculptural practices. So borrowing skin from the arm to sort of re restructure or remodel other areas of the body. And Harold Gilles, who is like a quite famous uh, s surgeon, um, he did a lot of work on soldiers, came up with this um, really fantastic way of regenerating bodily material, so using the, the fabric of the body um, as almost like a harvesting site for new sculptural material. So what he did was he cut out areas of the flesh, knowing that it would reheal itself, and sew it into a tube, and then you could essentially cut off that tube and use it elsewhere as like clay sort of thing. So yeah, if you do start to think of the body as this sort of maneuverable um, or malleable site um, in order to access new materials, um, you get an idea of sort of how things like uh, surgical procedures have developed um, that already look at the body as a as a um, as sort of fabric for design. So I find this video really amazing uh, looking at the, the sort of cross dissections of heads because it's very clean. <laughs> um, and this is a video showing maxillofacial surgery. And what's really interesting is they kind of just have made this animation that's like, oh look, you just cut a bit out and then you stick it together, maybe put a few screws in, um, and then you, you can generate a totally new face shape out of the bodily material. So th this has sort of become the basis of my research up to now. Um, I'm currently design, uh, designer, artist in residence at the Varg um, Mediamatic and View, uh, where I'm hoping to sort of further this research. But uh, I, I started a while ago, um, while I was doing my MA, to look at my own body and how I might restructure it, how I might look at some of these sort of procedures and how they might be used for, for various different things. So I looked at my own face and um, thought about how I might restructure it, uh, what, what, sort of, what are the consequences of, of doing that and, and why would you want to. So I designed a series of prosthetics that sort of imagined what it might be like to make your face shape more aerodynamic. Um, but really what's sort of interesting about this research is that we live in a world that's sort of governed by things like social norms. Um, uh, at the moment it seems almost absurd talking to you about these sort of procedures, but these are things that have been going on for a really long time. And as I know a lot of you are interested in materiality, the, the, logistically the materiality of um, the body is, is sort of quite interesting in terms of looking at when we are most when are we most logistically able to be modified? Um, and if you look at sort of a lot of old photos, this seems to be something that's done when people are babies because your bones aren't properly formed yet. Um, you're still you're growing at quite a quick rate, and that's why you get a lot of these old sort of images of things like head binding that people do to their children to sort of fit into society. So this sort of became the inspiration for um, a series of sculptures I did regarding. Uh, future modifications that parents might do to their children, um, or things that, surgical procedures that actually already exist that could be easily performed on a child's sort of unformed and malleable body. So yeah, I started with the aerodynamic baby um, that has the sort of ridged nose that was similar to the one that I tried to recreate. And then I started to think about other problems, so things that are happening in the world, um, why would we want to modify ourselves? Uh, and I started to look at things like environmental pressures. So, you know, the planet is getting hotter. Uh, and I looked at things like other ways that animals deal with this. So elephants have massive ears, lots of veins in to get rid of heat. If we uh, increase the surface area of our own heads, would that, would that do the same? 
Um, and then I started to look at things like social mobility. So could you um, increase your child's surface area inside their mouth so that they could do something like absorb more caffeine, um, work for longer hours, earn more money. Um, and then I started looking at health reasons, which is really one of the main, the main reasons that we sort of make sacrifices to our bodies. So as things like pollution is getting much worse, so is the incidence of asthma. So if you did something like remove the toe from, from your baby, would it be more likely to contract something like hookworm, which is a parasite that th theoretically diminishes allergies. So it seems like a smaller sacrifice to remove a toe in order to potentially help the baby's health later on in life. Um, or if you suffered from something like diabetes, would it be more helpful to have a, a new orifice in like a low, low fatty area that could mean that you could take drugs and absorb them over a sort of longer period of time rather than having to keep self-medicating throughout the day. So, uh, as I said earlier, I'm kind of interested in the way that we look at modifying ourselves as different to modifying animals. Um, and I started to think of uh, amalgamations that you might be able to make that would allow us to, to create sort of new, new organs or new things that it would take evolution millions of years to create. So this is a project, um, a more recent project called Parasitic Prosthesis. And I looked at people who suffer from testicular cancer. Um, and it's quite interesting because people, when they have their testicle removed, still lose a lot of things like the hormones that come with that body part. So if you could have a parasite that um, also offered you hormones, would you be happy to sort of live with this thing in your home or actually utilize this sort of li living prosthetic? So in a way, I suppose what I'm, what I'm interested in is the, the agency behind these kinds of technologies, why we might uh, include them in our, in our bodies. So if, if something is more biological, would we be more likely to allow it in our bodies rather than mechanical, because we've got quite used to things like mechanical defibrillators. So if you had a biological defibrillator, would you be equally as allowing uh, of having it inside your body? So this is a project where I designed some organs um, that are based on bioprinting technologies. So if you think of things now like xenotransplantation, where you can introduce animal cells into your body, um, and bioprinting, where you might be able to grow cells and amalgamate them to form complex 3D structures, you could essentially create completely new parts. Um, and this organ is sitting in that box over there. This was sort of a speculative surgical procedure um, where we tried to imagine what it would be like to have this organ fitted and um, what, what would the actual sort of choreography of that surgery be. So yeah, as I said, this was the um, organ that was, a, yeah, a defibrillating organ. Um, it's, it's essentially made of cilia cells from your ear that can recognize movement in liquids. Um, and a row of electrocyte cells that can be discharged through a strong muscular wall to essentially if you have a heart attack, the idea is that it could um, shock your heart to beating it back into its normal beating pattern. Um, this this uh, organ was designed for people who are potentially prone to having things like a stroke. So it's got a pouch of osmiotic cells that could, again, recognize pressure in liquids and could help um, a salivary gland from a leech release an anticoagulant to prevent you from having a stroke. And finally, this organ was designed for people who have cystic fibrosis. So what it essentially does is sits on top of your trachea and vibrates in order to dislodge mucus um, and dispel it through your digestive system. So, <laughs> um, more recently, um, I did a project looking at modification, but with a group of neuroscientists. And this was part of the BioArt and Design Awards and is now showing at the exhibition that William uh, spoke about earlier at Moo Gallery in Eindhoven. 
Um, and I worked with Marcel Dujeux and Joss van de Geest, who work at Erasmus Neuroscience Department, as well as uh, some of the researchers that I, I'm collaborating with in Plymouth. Um, Jack McKay Fletcher, who's a computational neuroscientist. Christos Melidis, who's a roboticist, and Veba Tiagis, who's also a neuroscientist. So it was quite, a, quite an interesting sort of group of people. Um, and what we became quite, of in, quite sort of interested in was brain modification. And because in a way I've looked a lot at things like bone and mechanical modification, but the brain is quite an interesting site for modification because it's still quite unknown. You know, you hear all these stories that someone had like a pole got stuck in their head and they had to have part of their brain removed but they didn't seem to show much of a change and then you hear other people who've had like you know tiny tiny brain surgery and it's affected them throughout their life so it's still a sort of area that's quite quite unknown and within neuroscience itself it seems quite a hotly debated topic whether we are just the sum of our neural networks, or as Gilbert Ryle says, like the ghost in the machine, where our bodies are sort of just vehicles for, for our mind. So the people who are working at the Human Connectome Project are looking a lot at things like memory and how, um, how or if our connections are representative of memories. Um, so Scientists uh, at the uh, Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, um, they haven't been able to yet do things like replicate um, uh, <laughs> across memory like things in sort of science fiction like Total Recall, but they have managed to um, alter memories within mice brains. So what they've done is essentially um, get a light emitting chemical, so they've modified the mouse's brain to emit um, a, a light emitting chemical um, that shows when new memories are formed. And the reason why this is sort of quite interesting is because this chemical itself is sensitive to light. So um, once you put input light into the brain, it essentially can modify the plasticity of the brain and, and essentially uh, affect affect memory. And if you think this is quite an amazing thing because the implications of this are quite intense. You could do things like completely alter how we take witness statements or alter traumatic memories. Um, so this sort of this piece of technology has, has massive scope. But um, in terms of how we learn about the brain now, uh, that we often use things like robotics. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know this is the iCub. Um, I know it's a bit freaky looking, but it's kind of uh, going back to things like de developmental modification. Um, it's used to see how our brains develop when we learn, um, when we're growing up. And the, the brain itself um, is quite interesting in terms of how it gains comprehension of our surroundings and our anatomy. So this is just a short video I found of a baby and what it's essentially doing is it's moving its limbs around, making motor movements to try and make sense of its surroundings and its sort of local environment. And this has been copied within robotics, so it's um, called motor babbling. And what the robots do are essentially, um, they train them to create random motor movements and then this is a simulation of the robot trying to figure out essentially where its limbs are within a space. So if you imagine you, your eyes are shut and you wake up and you're in a box and you're sort of trying to feel where your arms and legs are, that's essentially what this program is trying to achieve. So what we thought we'd try and do was have a look at my own brain um, and my, my own, uh, the way my own brain might develop as, as I learn. And we thought we might try and track some of this information into a machine. And we picked drones, not only because they're sort of they're a very hot topic right now, but um, they're quite an interesting object in, in terms of the fact that they're sort of representational of thought and action. So often someone in one place is making decisions and the drone is acting out else, elsewhere. So we thought it might be interesting if we could try and map some decision-making behaviors into this kind of machine. 
So what we did, this is me and Joss at Erasmus, um, we took a diffusion tensor MRI scan of my brain um, and, and intended to map this into a drone. Um, and we came out with all these amazing images, the sort of cross-sectional images, um, MRI scans of the brain. And, and the reason why this is sort of quite fascinating is because what we were trying to achieve was not just to sort of see the density of my brain, but also the, the strength of connections within different areas. And the diffusion tensor MRI, I'm sure, I don't know if any of you have had one before, but it's kind of different to an EEG. So EEG sends data in real time to something, to the computer, whereas what we wanted to do was sort of to take a snapshot of my brain at a certain time to see if we could see how it might develop. Um, so what the MRI machine does, um, and for any neuroscientists in the room, I'm sure this is very simple for you, but I found this quite fascinating. The MRI machine basically looks at water molecules in your head. And the theory is, is that when the water molecules are shaped weirdly, that's the, an indication of where a vessel lies in, in your mind. Um, so this was an image um, that we got from a computer algorithm that worked out where all my vessels were. And this is where Michael's research would have been extremely helpful. <laughs> because what we did was we selected nodes across the 3D surface um, and interior surface of my brain. And we probably, we picked about 720. And what we wanted to do was to measure the strength of connections between the nodes in order to create a computer program out of this information. But <laughs> it would have been really great to meet you earlier because we essentially did get out the ruler and we were measuring the fibers between each point, which was pretty, yeah. <laughs> I know, it sounds, but for me, I'm a visual person. I couldn't work out any other way. It's like, oh yeah, you get out the ruler. <laughs> Sorry? Well, it, the, the artificial neural network or the... Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the reason why the snapshot um, that I was talking about earlier is sort of so important is because we wanted to compare my learning behaviours with the machines over a period of time. So we were sort of trying to question whether these modelling techniques are in any way representative of my own brain. So, yeah, we created this... This was a visualization of our network, um, but this is sort of simplified. This shows about 200 of the nodes. And as you can see, between the nodes, some of the lines are slightly thicker. And this, um, this uh, we sort of changed this into a learning algorithm. So as the, the machine learns throughout the duration of the exhibition, this would update. So the reason why this is kind of interesting is because it not only sort of questions the legitimacy of modeling modeling the brain in terms of um, like trying to recreate such an immensely complex um, rhetoric that's that, that's sort of inside your own brain into a machine but also it's kind of interesting in the fact that we might be able to get scientific data out of this at uh, this sort of graph um, so our intent really in the, at the end of the project was to, uh, to sort of highlight some of the questions that are happening um, in Marcel and Joss's research regarding behaviours and decision making um, and, and use the drone which is this sort of big blob here um, as like a, a conduit to reflect on, on their scientific practice. So this is the drone and it moves quite slowly um, and it's still a bit of a work in progress. We still haven't managed to create a comparison between myself because I think this, this would take a, a this, well, Weber's written out a, a experiment for this, but it would take 10 weeks, so we're hoping within the next year we might be able to do that. But thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.